Yes, is it still raining outside? Is it? No. Well, better. So I'm very glad to have uh, this lecture of Adam Yerinsky on art, architecture and place, which is very well fitted here for the Academy and our audience. And I'm going to brief, uh, uh, give a brief introduction. Adam Yerinsky is the co-founder with Stephen Cassell, who will also be in residence in December here at the Academy of Architecture Research Office, a 36-person practice based in New York City. The practice is celebrating its 30th year this year in 2023, and ARO has a diverse body of work, including commercial, educational, cultural, and public project. It is the recipient of 100 design awards, including the 2020 American Institute of Architects Firm Award and the Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt National Design Award for Architecture. Adam holds an undergraduate degree in architecture from the University of Virginia and a Master of Architecture from Princeton University. He's a lecturer at MIT and has served as the Eilil Sarninen Professor of University of Michigan, the Thomas Jefferson Professor at the University of Virginia, and the Eero Sar Sarninen Visiting Professor at Yale University. He has also taught at Harvard University, Princeton University, Parsons School of Design, and Washington University in St. Louis. A warm welcome to Adam. Thank you, Ilaria. Uh, mille grazie per questa opportunità di parlare, per parlare del nostro lavoro, anche se in inglese. <laughs> uh, and then the only other thing I wanted to say in, in Italian was allora, <laughs> because I love that expression. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, Ilaria, and I really want to thank everyone here at the Academy who's uh, made this last six weeks just a really special experience. Um, I've just totally enjoyed getting to know um, the fellows and residents and scholars here, and I certainly hope to keep in touch with everybody uh, in the future. Um, I want to thank my co uh, partners, or, uh, my partners and my co-workers and my wife for making it possible for me to have this experience. Um, and as Ilaria said, this is the 30th anniversary of our practice, so it's an opportunity in time to take a break. Uh, this is the longest by far, but three times longer than I've ever been out of the day-to-day -day routine of our practice. And so it takes a lot of people to help make that possible, and I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, I mean, there's so much to say about being here at the Academy, but whether it's the meals together, the informal conversations, uh, working in the garden every week, um, being part of the sustainable food program, it's just been great. And I'm um, uh, I would highly recommend this to anyone. Um, um, before getting into the topic of the lecture, I wanted to just give a brief introduction to the work of our office. So as Laria said, um, this photo is about a year old. We're a little bit larger now, but um, so we're a 36 person firm. Uh, we actually are in new offices now. This was in our, our Manhattan space. We're now in downtown Brooklyn. Um, and we're a diverse group of people who work together to engage the world and change it for the better through architecture, connecting people to each other and the environment, furthering the missions and goals of our clients and advancing equity and resilience. We have a deliberately wide range of projects, um, but across them our work is united by a consistent methodology of inquiry and collaboration to deeply engage the people affected by arch our architecture and the phys social and physical context in which it's located. We also love building um, both the process of design and construction and the physical reality of, of, of buildings, details, materials, space. Um, so I'm not going to get into any of this, but as Ilaria said, we have a broad range of work from projects in homes in rural areas like this one in Telluride, Colorado, to work for uh, clients like Knoll. We've done about seven or eight um, showrooms and offices for Knoll around the United States, a furniture company, um, to projects in public parks, um, such as this kayak pavilion on the Hudson River in Beacon, New York, or this boathouse and visitor center in Brooklyn Bridge Park along the East River. Um, work for schools, uh, a lower school building at Riverdale Country School in 
um, uh, Riverdale in the Bronx. Um, and uh, rendering of a building that's going to be finished uh, later uh, in 2024, uh, one of two new public schools uh, in downtown Brooklyn. This is the uh, primary school on the back, so the other side of the block is the high school. That will be the largest passive house uh, school buildings in the United States, actually in North America when they're completed in mid 2024. To work for higher education institutions, this is an addition and renovation of the architecture school at Princeton University, uh, student residence at Tulane University, and then work for cultural nonprofits um, such as um, CBST Synagogue in Manhattan, which is the largest LGBTQ uh, synagogue in the world. Uh, and then um, organizations such as the Vilcek Foundation, uh, which is a uh, nonprofit dedicated to the recognition of the contributions of immigrants to the arts and sciences, immigrants to the United States, to the arts and sciences. And um, we work at all scales. So these are uh, acoustical products that we designed for a division of Knoll called the Aero Collection, all the way to um, the largest possible scale, really strategically designing infrastructure and public space. This is a proposal that we did as part of an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art called Rising Currents. This is called the New Urban Ground. And I mention all of that because the projects that I'll be talking about today are really unique within our work, although interestingly, we have several of them at this point, so maybe it will become a, a new, uh, a larger part of our body of work. And these are um, 101 Spring Street, which is the upper left, uh, the upper right, the Rothko Chapel uh, in Houston, Texas. The lower left, the um, uh, Frederick Church Center for Art and Landscape in at Olana, uh, Frederick Church's home in near Hudson, New York, and then uh, work for the Dia Art Foundation. And the first three projects are unique in that they're places created by artists to enable people to experience um, the most essential values and intentions that these artists had. In the case of Rothko and Judd, they stated that they were striving for a unity between their art and its context. Um, and our approach in these projects involves a great sensitivity to the qualities and experience of these sites to maintain the authenticity and integrity uh, of the experience as these artists intended. Um, this requires a deep engagement with context. Um, both the physical place, but also the legacy of the artist and their intentions. So it's a deep dive into that. And uh, at the same time, uh, an understanding of the mission and principles uh, and goals of the organizations that are the stewards of the legacies of these artists on an ongoing basis. So aligning the, the artist's intentions uh, with the ongoing missions of these organizations as part of these projects. And then uh, the first two projects, um, Spring Street and the chapel involve the uh, renovation of existing building fabric. And so we, there's value in the existing buildings as well as the work for DIA. And this is both environmentally and conceptually important. And then finally, there, these projects are highly collaborative. There are large teams of people involved and architectural, as the architects of these projects, we act to synthesize this information to create a cohesive uh, result. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in each project. and then. The lower right, uh, um, uh, 101, uh, sorry, DIA Art Foundation brings some of the ideas that I'll be talking about to the present, uh, where we've created spaces that support the visions of contemporary artists. And by the way, this is the new Aero Green that was the first time it's been run at this scale. <laughs> so this will only be up on divider slides, <laughs> but it looks a lot smaller on my, on my notebook computer. So 101 Spring Street was um, the studio and home of the artist Donald Judd. It's in Soho in Lower Manhattan. And he purchased the building in 1968 for $68,000 actually. And it, he lived and worked there from 1968 until 1994 when he died. And it's here where he developed his concept of what he called the permanently installed spaces for his work and that of uh, some of his contemporaries, which were in direct um, contrast to um, the presentation of work in um, temporary exhibitions or museums. So to create a place where you could experience this work as he had intended uh, over time. And I've always been fascinated by this sketch on the right of the floor plans of the space that he, which he made, which always reminds me of one of his stack pieces, if you're familiar with his work, 
uh, but basically he was describing how there's sort of one program on each floor of the building, which is a very Juddian thing to do. You know, you eat on this floor, you sleep on this floor, et cetera, but calibrating the building to his needs as a place to live as well as um, show work. Building is amazing. It's an 1870 um, uh, mercantile structure, really proto-modern in terms of the lightness, the very high percentage of glass to wall. Uh, so he had a good eye for buildings. Um, and the spaces that he felt were most important to his conception of the permanently installed uh, space are the third floor, fourth floor, and fifth floor of the building. And I'll talk about those in a moment. Uh, we touched virtually every part of this project. This was an eight-year-long project from the beginning to the end. And I put up the uh, org chart of part of the team just because to emphasize this is the same with all of the projects. There are a large number of collaborators involved. And this project in particular had a lot of administrative uh, hurdles and challenges relative to getting this approved by the Department of City Planning and Landmarks Commission and other things which I'm not going to be talking about. Um, we also worked with um, a collaborating architect, Walter Melvin Architects, who are specialists in historic preservation, and they were responsible for the restoration of the cast iron on the building. Interestingly, all the columns are structural, and the spandrel panels, which span horizontally, are non-structural, so it's very much like a modern curtain wall in some respects. And surprisingly, most of the cast iron was in intact and in very good condition, but all of the pieces that could be removed were removed and restored. And then some of the pieces, primarily those that would have water resting on them, were, were remade. Um, the building also has on the cellar and sub-cellar levels, which are amazing because they have daylight that passes from the street all the way down 20 feet below grade, which is a great invention that we should think more about. Um, are offices for Judd Foundation. So these were existing spaces um, that we renovated and also provided restrooms and, and, and mechanical systems and things for the building. So these are two views of the um, cellar and subcellar. And then a new, two new uh, egress stairs within the building. The one I'm showing here is actually made out of blackened steel plate and slate treads. And it basically passes tightly between the occupied spaces and the actual brick envelope of the building. Um, so it's almost like you're passing through a kind of archaeological dig to get down to these lower levels of the building. The third floor space, um, uh, on this space, Judd basically added a uh, oak floor, which is held slightly away from the existing walls, and then used just ordinary um, base coat plaster that you could get out of a bag from US gypsum. Um, to um, basically plaster all of these walls with a rough finish. But over time, as you can see in the upper left image, this finish had been um, saturated by machine oil, which was from when the building was a uh, basically sweatshop. It was um, had textile uh, uh, clothing manufacturing in it. And so it, the, this plaster had also started to delaminate from the building. And Judd was very expedient in how he approached working in buildings, and so um, but over time, you know, 20, 30 years later, um, this was one floor in particular where we really had to remove all of the finish to restore it back to the intent that he had. So um, the large floor piece in the center was created, uh, everything was protected, and then this, this was stripped clean. Uh, this is the finished uh, floor space, and um, of course, we couldn't get this USG plaster right out of the bag to match the color that he had, so we had to do very complicated Venetian plaster <laughs> that required multiple sampling and a lot of time and effort and really amazing craftspeople to do that. But, um, and, and in this space, what's particularly interesting just vis-a-vis -vis the installed space is the relationship between the proportions of this floor piece and the space in which it sit. They actually are the same exact proportion if you look at them in plan and the diagonal from one corner of the space to the corner of the stair on the left would pass right through this large floor piece. We used what's called a VESDA system, which is a very early smoke detection apparatus to constantly monitor air and uh, for fire protection, but the, what you see is just this tiny little hole, it's an eighth of an inch diameter to, so that we didn't interrupt the volume of the space with smoke detectors and other equipment. And then the reveal, which again, Judd considered 
what he called, quote unquote, his invent, one of his inventions in the building is there. Uh, and it's a brass strip laid into the gap between the plywood, uh, the oak floor and the existing uh, floor. The fourth floor was probably the most technically complicated intervention in the building um, because Judd had removed the enclosure around the existing fire stair, which uh, was not allowed by code. <laughs> and um, so in order to get this approved, the project uh, get approved by the city uh, and the fire department, there had to be a smoke purge system put into the space. This was designed by Arup, which is an engineering global engineering firm, has a special fire consultancy, and they did what are called computational fluid dynamic modeling, which is here to show how you could compartmentalize the smoke from the space and allow egress through this stair for a certain amount of time to safely exit. So it was among a handful of requirements in the building. And our contribution to this was how to integrate these large baffles that close to provide this compartmentalization uh, into the existing space um, so that they don't interrupt the flow of space. Um, and again, without, we do, certainly didn't want to create a, an enclosure here. This is the stair there. So there are panels which are operated by electromechanical um, uh, mechanisms that close and basically hold the smoke in the top part. And then there's a very large exhaust fan which sucks this air out um, through the roof in the event of a fire. So this is the completed uh, view of the fourth floor facing to the north. And just the other piece was that Judd also took out the sprinkler system on several floors of the building. He didn't let the building department in these buildings, by the way. <laughs> and that's part of the reason uh, the Judd Foundation needed to do these so that the public could actually be welcomed in to the spaces. Um, and so we put in what's called a dry pipe system for the building where the sprinkler pipes actually run in the hollow parts of the structural columns of the building, but they don't have any water in them so that they're not subject to freezing in the event of um, you know, cold weather. I should back up and say, and I forgot to mention this at the beginning, that the, really the, the primary scope of the project was determined by Judd's um, last will and testament where he said he wanted to preserve these spaces in perpetuity and also make them accessible to the public. So the preservation of the space and the public accessibility really drove all of the measures that we did in the project. This is another view. Again, he added this wood plane on the ceiling and on the floor and create this kind of, to me this has always felt like a kind of Miesian space, this sort of floating uh, parallel planes of the ceiling and floor and an open opening to the exterior. And finally on the top floor and the roof, um, a lot of equipment was added which all had to be set back so it wasn't visible from the street. Um, and then um, adding structural elements to support this equipment on the roof um, this is a view of the completed space. And the large Dan Flavin piece there is really beautiful and was actually a gift from Dan Flavin to Donald Judd. And because there are no l other um, light fixtures on this floor, we actually wired the um, emergency lighting to this uh, art piece. So in the event of a fire, that would help guide you to the fire stairs, um, <laughs> which is a nice detail. Um, but what's interesting about that piece, um, this. Um, barrier piece that, that um, Flavin made is its rhythm in relation to the regular rhythm of, this, of the cast iron structure, you know, just on the other side. So the Rothko, so that project was completed in 2013. We began working with the Rothko Chapel in 2016 uh, on the renovation of their existing building and then programming and helping them develop uh, a new North Campus to accommodate expanded programming that they had. This project is interesting because it's really the, um, the existing Rothko Chapel is the result of an incredible collaboration between patrons, Dominique and John de Menil, and uh, Mark Rothko, uh, the painter. And that's a letter that he wrote to them while he was working on the panels for the Rothko Chapel there. So it, it, it's really quite remarkable. And I'll talk about what makes it so special as a place. Um, and it's both, uh, the mission of the chapel is both about spirituality, spirituality through art and contemplation, so the kind of individual contemplation, as well as social justice and action. And these are embodied in both the experience of the chapel, which is this very introverted experience, uh, experience very on a personal level, 
and then the uh, reflecting pool and the sculpture uh, Broken Obelisk by Barnett Newman, which is dedicated to Martin Luther King, and which uh, the Demineals installed there um, uh, as part of the sort of chapel precinct. Um, I won't get into this, but a key part of our process on many projects, but uh, um, this was one of the earlier ones where we did it, was to develop a set of project principles that came out of very close collaboration and engagement with um, our client, in this case, the Rothko Chapel. And that set the terms on which um, our work happened and also allowed us in later phases to judge whether or not we were being successful in, in meeting some of these requirements. But um, everything, you see the word experience there in the first two, so it's similar to the 101 Spring Street. It's how do you preserve this experience, which is very fragile in many respects. So the chapel, um, was opened in 1971 and has always hosted convenings. It has a uh, awards program called the Oscar Romero Prize, which recognizes um, um, people who are advocating for social justice in their countries around the world, as well as um, local community engagement in the spaces there. But over time, their, um, the frequency and number of these events has increased, and so there was a need to add additional space for convening. And then the chapel itself uh, is this space formed by 14 monumental painted panels which Mark Rothko created um, at the behest of the Demineals um, and which sort of define this kind of very unusual top lit space. And what's particularly interesting in two respects to the chapel, it was originally designed uh, for the University of St. Thomas which is, was designed by um, Philip Johnson and is located just a few blocks to the um, east of here. It was relocated by the um, Demon Eels to this location and is very much uh, important part of its um, character is this juxtaposition between this kind of extraordinary sacred place within a kind of everyday neighborhood um, that is a residential neighborhood in Houston. And at the same time, Rothko also wanted to display his art. He had written previously about wanting to, people to experience his art as if it were in a pilgrimage chapel um, and that you could experience it again outside of the context of a museum or a gallery, which he felt diminished the experience of the work. So um, this building is located uh, in this neighborhood. Of course, the Demon Eels bought all of the housing surrounding this to maintain that character of the neighborhood, which is really unusual and unique. Um, and this is a site, aerial site of the uh, area not uh, shaded is the um, Rothko Chapel's property, but the large building to the left is the De Menil Museum, uh, the Menil Collection, which is designed by Renzo Piano and some of the other buildings for the um, Menil Collection. And then to the east, to the right side of the Rothko properties are buildings for um, the University of St. Thomas. So another impetus behind this project was to preserve the character of the chapel precinct and the neighborhood, which is under some development pressure, not really from the Menil, but from the University of St. Thomas, which owns the property here across diagonally across the street from the chapel. So these are the existing conditions, which again, you see this kind of, we call it the necklace of bungalows that surround the chapel. The, uh, and these are offices for the Rothko Chapel now and uh, uh, restrooms. This is Menil Park, which is a very unusual uh, public park um, and, and this whole neighborhood has a pedestrian scale, um, which again is somewhat unusual for Houston. And this shows when the second phase of the project is completed, there'll be a new North Campus, which I'll talk about, which will have offices and archive, program center, welcome house I'll show was completed in the first phase of work, then a meditation garden, and then um, a landscape which is designed to provide porosity but also buffer the chapel from uh, this future development to the uh, northeast. Uh, very extensive renovation of the existing building. I'm not going to describe all of this. I'll just highlight a couple of things. Um, but uh, key to it was making the building more resilient, relocating HVAC for the structure from below ground in a pit next to the building to a new energy house, which is part of the new North Campus, as well as um, flood protection. Uh, this is at right at street level, and this area does is susceptible to flooding. Um, and then 
uh, the removal of accretions that happened over time. So there were glass vestibule walls added to, in the uh, 1999 renovation of the building, and we relocated, created a vestibule within the um, existing um, uh, front part of the building, as well as um, put in acoustical um, absorbent uh, plaster on the interior to basically uh, quiet down the sound within the interior, but and then relocated program that had happened in the vestibule to um, the welcome house. So a, a orientation desk, a little um, gift shop or bookstore, and um, yeah, that sort of moment where you kind of need to ask for information and whatnot. So that was relocated. But then when we were not, unfortunately not able to do probes before we removed the finishes of the ceiling, which was always going to get replaced, and we discovered there was significant cracking in the unreinforced concrete block walls of the chapel. So um, basically every 30 inches there was a vertical slit cut into the wall and rebar was grouted in to provide lateral strength to the building so that it could resist um, hurricane forces and, and meet new current codes. So this was a uh, uh, about a six to nine month uh, delay in the project, but was really important to, um, to have as part of our work. And so, but the, the main part of the work in the chapel had to do with improving the quality of daylight to the interior. Rothko never visited Houston and completed the paintings before uh, the chapel opened, and he died before the chapel opened. So um, one of the things he was not aware of, although he took you know, great effort to mock up the chapel interior and was directly involved in the design of the chapel um, was the quality, the harsh quality of the light in Houston. And so almost from day one, um, the, the, there was a problem of way too much daylight in the interior, which diminished your ability to perceive the kind of depth and coloration of these painted panels. And so there had been three prior attempts to control that light in the lower right is the, uh, was the most recent from 1999, um, using the best available computer technology that they had to sort of understand how light would fall on the, these panels, but uh, nonetheless created quite a lot of glare between basically a large baffle below the skylight. So a key part of the project, really the most essential part, was working very closely with George Sexton, who's a lighting designer specializing in daylight, to create a way of filtering this light to the interior. Um, and George in his office created a one inch to a foot model of the chapel where you could actually sit on a chair with your head inside the chapel and look at that character of the space. This was on the roof of his building in Washington, DC. So not, not exactly the same latitude as Houston, but, um, and that led to a strategy to create a series of louvers that basically prevent direct sunlight from entering the interior, but still allow you to feel and sense the quality of ambient daylight outside. This is a detail on the left of uh, the corner of the skylight. This is a mock-up on site and then um, to test just the scale of it, but there's basically a uh, insulated glass layer with a diffusing glass these um, custom designed louvers that are, it's in an oct octagonal pattern because the plan of the building is octagonal. And then there are also digital projectors that were each is in an acoustically isolated air conditioned enclosure that provide uh, additional light, not during the day because I think they would never wanted to rely on daylight, on uh, artificial illumination for this, but basically for those times of the year when, you know, late afternoon there's virtually no light left or if they're having an event or, or something like that. So this was a mock-up. The um, digital projector to actually illuminate the entire wall. This, this, this point we're just testing it with one panel um, in place. So the completed chapel and those, these tabs are actually mirrors because they bounce light from the digital projector to the wall. Um, the completed chapel basically, um, the finishes were brought back. The interior is in a kind of light gray finish, which is what um, how Rothko wanted his work to be, um, uh, the field on which the panels to be viewed, and then a view of the uh, skylight above. 
and then another view. We also had the opportunity to shift this wall forward about six inches because the shadow pattern from this existing, um, this is the kind of north apse of the building, was very close to the top of the painting. So uh, working with the chapel and with Christopher Roscoe, um, uh, basically the decision was made since we were taking off all of the finishes on the interior to pull this forward, just give a little bit more space there. Otherwise though, all of the dimensions were returned to the, how Judd had designed them. Sorry, how Rothko had, had uh, designed the layout of the paintings. This is a plan of the North Campus. This shows the landscape around the South with the existing bungalows removed and then relocating one which will be a guest house for the Rothko Chapel. This is the archive and administration building which is basically aligned with the North apse of the chapel program center. You can actually fit the octagonal space of the chapel inside the program center. It's the same capacity, about 180 people. Uh, the welcome house, which I'll show in a moment, which is open and then lobby and then um, services and the energy house is above this area. This just shows you the scale. So we struck a line from the parapet of the um, chapel across to form the parapet of the roof of the buildings on the north campus. And then the scale of the um, program space is the same basically height as the um, bottom of the uh, opening to the skylight, about um, 18 feet. The character of the new buildings are really bridging between the uh, kind of exceptional quality of the chapel uh, and the residential quality of the neighborhood. So we used wood um, to clad these buildings primarily with one exception on the Welcome House brick wall. Uh, which is the same brick as the chapel, but we're very interested in the qualities of light and shadow and shade uh, and this kind of dappled light from the live oak trees, which is such an amazing part of the kind of urban quality of this neighborhood and other areas in Houston. Uh, the left is a rendering of the detail of the facade of the uh, archive and administration building, and then the right are two residences we designed, and this is part of the reason we're interested in a broad range of work is to have cross-fertilization between these different kinds of projects. So the um, house in Martha's Vineyard that we designed many years ago, oops, sorry, has uh, a custom milled cedar siding which casts shadows on itself, very much like the kind of oak, scrub oak forest in which it sits. And this is a house in Connecticut that we did just a few years ago, which also uses a custom milled cedar siding to create a play of light and shadow. We're actually using a, a, a kind of wood called a koya, which is a special kind of wood that's acetylated to give it real durability in this Houston climate. Um, but it's natural, natural wood that has a natural treatment to it. This is the welcome house. So again, the idea with this building was it's a porch-like building, very small in scale, uh, similar to the scale of the houses along the street. It has a... Uh, a welcome desk, or orientation desk, a small gift shop, restrooms, and lockers, so you can kind of arrive here, or if a group of, of people arrive on a bus, which is very frequent, they can gather underneath the overhang, shaded overhang of the building here. And from inside the building, as well as, this is taken from behind, facing toward the chapel, of course, you are immediately oriented to the, um, to the chapel building itself, which is always, of course, an interestingly, as it's back to the street, and you have to kind of discover the front from um, getting into the side of the block. And then you'll see in the, in the phase two of the project, there's a, a walk that links directly across the street to the existing South Campus. So yeah, here you can see. So this is an aerial rendering of the program center and the archive and admin. That's the welcome house, which is completed. This is a rendering of the um, courtyard space. So basically the North Campus, in contrast to the chapel precinct, um, the North Campus is this ensemble of three buildings which are deliberately open to the street and engage the public in a very different experience. So it's, it's not about discovering this internalized experience of the chapel, which is so special, but it's actually something that really opens up to the street visually and spatially. And that's the program center. There's also a skylight. So we're using daylight in the program center to wash the back wall of, the, of that space to create brightness so that you can actually see into it um, during the day, which will help kind of break down that barrier between the glazing and the, and the interior. And then this is a brisole or a shade screen 
that because the glazing actually continues up uh, on the inside there. And this will be used for uh, events and gatherings as well, the exterior. This is a view, rendering view from the program center out back toward the chapel again, where you can see and, and understand your place in relation to that. So the key part of our architecture was to um, balance kind of deference to both the quality of the neighborhood as well as the exceptional quality of the chapel building um, without diminishing sort of that very delicate relationship between the two. And then this is a photograph of the currently completed. The construction drawings are finished for the phase two and the, uh, it's anticipated construction on phase two will start in 2024. So we're excited about that. This project, which is um, the Frederick Church Center for um, uh, Art and Landscape, as I said, is in near Hudson, New York, and it's on a 250-acre property that Frederick Church uh, acquired and, and where he built his home uh, in the 19th century. So for those of you who don't know Church's work, he was really one of the preeminent Hudson River School painters. Um, he, probably his first great hit was Heart of the Andes, which was is exhibited at the Metropolitan Museum and was a spectacle in its day, enormous painting. Mm -hmm. um, and the latter part of his life, he uh, developed the site of Olana as a um, really a kind of early uh, form of land art, in effect, where he could create three-dimensionally these vistas of the surrounding um, landscape through carriage roads and the experience of the site itself. And so, um, that's really was the, uh, the driver for our project. The site is now a New York State historic site and public park, and our client is Olana, uh, the Olana Partnership, which is a nonprofit organization that operates the site with the state. We started working on this project in 2017. And this is, um, sorry, I skipped one. This is the larger site. So, um, our landscape architect on the Rothko Chapel project is a firm called Nelson Bird Wolfs, um, amazing collaborators. And on this project, they were actually, and we were involved in, in on the Rothko project prior to them coming on board and then brought them on board as part of our team. In this case, the tables were turned and Nelson Bird Wolfs had developed a larger strategic landscape plan for the entire site, uh, of which they had identified a site for a future visitor center, which uh, is located here in the southern part of the site but this shows you some of the carriage roads and basically everything on the site he created, uh, the farm, the lake he built, um, he reforested a site that had been um, heavily um, uh, cleared. And the location of the um, visitor center is at an important moment where there's a vista that church created along a carriage road back to the main house. The main house was designed with Calvert Vox. It's this amazing kind of, um, Moorish sort of uh, style house that's quite beautiful and you can tour the inside of that as well. Uh, the site includes a roughly 50 car parking lot as well as the building and then a sequence of spaces that connect you to this viewpoint. So it be the building is really an interpretive threshold to the larger experience of the Alana site. And um, all of the site is, has been designed with native plantings as well as um, stormwater uh, rain gardens and, and to manage stormwater um, as part of the overall um, sort of sustainability strategy for the project. The building is very simple. Uh, it's a one-story low-slung low structure, about 5,000 square feet, which basically is slightly shaped by the kind of movement against which uh, the public uh, um, takes as you, as you go from the parking to the, the viewpoint. And, um, and the building also folds, the roof plane folds to acknowledge this kind of amphitheater space that uh, is a kind of inside-outside space that's adjacent to a multi-purpose space within the building. So very simple massing and form. Uh, the plan is really simple, so entry lobby, multi-purpose space, back of house, offices, um, um, non-gendered um, restrooms. And um, yeah, very simple program. There's a view from uh, above the lake facing toward the south uh, of the building, which is really screened, so you cannot see it from the view shed of the uh, Olana house. It's not visible from there, which was really important <laughs> and was tested with balloons and other things to make sure you couldn't see it. 
um, and uh, and when it's you know replanted, it will become part of the the forest, and you'll come to the lake view as a kind of clearing moment. So we wanted to engage churches. Um, uh, kind of vision for this integration of nature and culture through uh, two things. One was a reference to what he called the ombra, which is a space between inside and outside, which is on the main house, this is the house, as well as the purposeful quality of the, some of the farm buildings, and this is the pump house on the site as well. So the building is really a place of arrival, but it's not the destination. You know, ultimately, you're experiencing the site and the larger landscape. But we wanted, so we wanted to calibrate this building in terms of this connection to site, but also this kind of purposeful quality. This is a rendering. The building is actually under construction right now. They've, the structure is up, and it was going to be completed later in 2024. But this is a rendering uh, from the arrival um, oval to the lobby, so making wayfinding really clear. We're using bird-friendly glazing, which is really important. That's um, something that's increasingly being used uh, in the United States, and we've used it on other projects. Um, the entry lobby, the building is made out of glue laminated timber beams, columns, and then cross laminated timber roof panels, which are a low carbon way of building. Um, that's again in keeping with the larger um, history of the site in terms of reforestation, as well as just the environmental uh, attributes of that. And then a view to the multipurpose room multi-purpose room looking toward the view uh, point as well as to the amphitheater beyond. This is a place for, you can eat, you can also, they can also do presentations and lectures and events in this space. Oops. And then this is the cross laminated timber roof panels, uh, glue and beams and columns. All of the beams and columns are actually up. I just got an email yesterday, of site photographs of that, so that's exciting. And I should say the building is also all electric, which is really important. Uh, and there is a large solar array that's uh, an enabling project that's happening after our project that's funded already on a adjacent, um, on the maintenance um, yard for Olana, which is not on the historic site. So it's gonna provide more than enough power to our, our project. And then this, this we just finished this building uh, last year, but it's uh, mass timber building for University of Washington Tacoma, which is our first mass timber building. So we're excited about having the opportunity to use this technology more. And then a view looking back from the lake viewpoint toward the multipurpose room. Um, and it's kind of uh, this rendering, a lot of time went into this to get the, just the right Hudson River light uh, <laughs> feeling spilling about it. But you will get this view of the view shed beyond from, from this site as well. So again, a building integrated with and in deference to its site, but presenting itself um, in terms of some of the key tenants of that, uh, Roth, that uh, church had for Olana. Finally, um, I'll just talk briefly about um, the uh, work that we've been doing for DIA Art Foundation. So um, specifically DIA Chelsea, which is a group of three buildings that DIA has in, um, on the west side of Manhattan between, on 22nd Street between um, 11th and 10th Avenues, so the highlighted areas there. Um, we've been working with DIA since 2017. Um, so what we started with were three buildings that DIA owns uh, on the north side of the street, two one-story structures, which, and then a six-story building, which also includes DIA's offices, and we, um, DIA had been using all, all of these buildings, although they did not occupy all of the ground floor. There was a commercial art gallery on this floor. So um, because of the scope of the project and some of the work that we did inside, I'll describe it later, but we basically replaced the facades on these two buildings, kept the structure intact in the interior, and then reworked the ground level facade on this building to create a new entry lobby and glazing into the entry and separate it from the entry into the rest of the building. So there's a clear dis distinction between the two. And we used brick, um, I mean, DIA has an amazing history and legacy of using existing buildings and adapting them to um, support the visions of artists and to create, really to diminish in a way their institutional identity in deference to the, um, 
the artist's intentions for the work. So in a way, the kind of anti-museum in some respects, and also favoring kind of long-term installation of work that you can go back to see over and over again. So um, uh, one of the decisions though then we had to do was, so if you're replacing facades, how do you do that in a way that's consonant with Dia's values? And so brick was really a natural material to use because it is such a amazing kind of vernacular for many of the um, mercantile and warehouse districts of New York City, particularly from the 19th and early 20th centuries, like Chelsea area. Um, and, but then detailing it in a way that would be refined and um, give a kind of sense of intentionality to it, um, since, since, you know, in effect, these are new facades. So we chose to replicate the brick that's used uh, on the upper part of the building with brick here, which was a challenge matching that and then used new um, iron spot brick on these buildings. Um, but so each building is really distinct, but part of a kind of larger ensemble that is in effect Dia. And one of the other ironic things about Dia in this neighborhood is they are, a, um, they are open um, and free to the public. Um, they're not a commercial art gallery. They were one of the pioneers in this neighborhood, but actually now there are literally, you know, several hundred art galleries in this neighborhood. So what does it mean for Dia to be in this neighborhood? So there are very small, subtle things that we tried to do to just give that a kind of sense of the permanence and quality that they have um, versus perhaps other um, sort of more commercial enterprises. Which I'll try to talk about them. So this is the street front, three buildings. Um, and the center building has a bifold overhead door, which is an homage to the door that was on the existing building. And then the western building has a uh, sliding glass door. Both of those large doors allow art to be brought in directly, you know, large scale art pieces between inside and outside. And then the lobby has a view uh, and daylight to the, uh, to the street. So really activating the street and, and communicating to the public this. Um, some of the detailing of the brick. The other kind of inspiration for the detailing of the brick, particularly the jams of these doors, was Robert Irwin's entry pavilion at Dia Beacon, which uh, is a beautiful brick building set against uh, existing um, early 20th century factory building. And so we were kind of um, quoting a stacked uh, brick pattern, which Irwin uses in part of that as kind of a way that the brick returns into the opening, and then we otherwise used it, what was called a common bond uh, brick pattern for the uh, brick on the center and western building. This is a shout out to Georgie Stout and Two by Four, who the graphic designers for Dia, who also uh, redesigned, I think, and refreshed Dia's um, identity as part of uh, concurrent with when our project was happening. Um, And then the plan of the three buildings. So what's interesting is each building is a unique structural system. Um, this is concrete wrapped steel. This is steel. This is wood. And so each of the buildings are, are compartmentalized. There's a whole complexity of how to do that to meet building code. Um, and the biggest changes happened really in this uh, six-story building where we added what's called a talk space, which allows a whole another level of public engagement and programming. Uh, that Dia hadn't been able to do at this scale before on this location, as well as a bookstore which uh, sells uh, Dia books, Dia publications, uh, and then you know, restrooms for the public. Um, and then the center building is an exhibition uh, space, and then the um, western building is also exhibition space. Oh, I didn't mention, but you can see them with snow on top of them. These are. Uh, Joseph Boy's 7,000 Oaks, uh, which are installed on this block and in the neighborhood, which is quite beautiful. This is a night view just showing the, the, the three buildings, how they're related to each other uh, and illuminate the street at night. This is also a, a Dan Flavin piece, which I think of as being kind of a reference to Dia's prior space on the south side of the block, which had an amazing vertical Dan Flavin in the stairwell of the building, which is a taller building. And what was important is that even in the building, uh, the eastern building that has the talk space, 
you get a view from the street all the way to the uh, north side of the talk space. So there's a view straight from all the way through the building. So you can always see the full and understand the full limits of each of these buildings. This is a view looking from the threshold of the door in the talk space back to the street level. Uh, welcome uh, reception, uh, reception desk, a bookstore there. A lot of time was spent kind of calibrating um, you know, how much presence this millwork should have and really being deferential to the character of the space itself. And this is the talk space, which again is shown here in a lecture configuration, has um, pipe rail and a lot of infrastructure to provide for various types of presentations. Um, and you can project on all th three surfaces and then the back side of the talk space has storage for seating and um, tables and uh, technology. And these are some of the events that have happened in the talk space since the project was completed in 2021. So presentations, gatherings, and events really activate that space. And then I'll just take you through a sequence of the spaces. So this is looking to the west um, at the doorway that connects to the central exhibition space from directly from the lobby. And a decision was made to really, on within the building sequence, register each of these buildings still as discrete and uh, give it its own, in a way, character and identity, partly which comes out of the existing structural systems and spatial um, character of the spaces, but also for reasons of climate control. We put in a um, new um, museum quality humidification system in the center and the Western building uh, exhibition uh, galleries to allow DIA to take loans from museums and things like that. So we had to have doors that would allow you to compartmentalize those spaces as well as for fire reasons. This again shows the six story building, the center, and then this um, Western building. And we also, I'll, won't, I'll only show one or two slides, but we also designed DIA's offices and relocated them from the fourth floor to the sixth floor and the fifth floor of the building. This is um, all of the HVAC that serves the center gallery and the Western gallery um, to um, allow for the, you know, no sensation of the presence of any of this stuff when you're inside the space. So, but this is what it took to achieve that. Um, and also daylight is an incredibly important part of, of all of Dia's spaces. So the skylights that you see here were all existing. We replaced them with new skylights um, but they, the openings were all, were all there already. This is just protection that was from this building being built. That's all been removed. Uh, and and the, this wasn't quite finished when this photo was taken. And again, the center building with the um, bifold door open. The, these spaces are really the opposite of a white box. So they're, they're very much allowing the character of the existing brick to be present in this center building. Um, and this was a, you know, a, a storage building. It had several lives before Dia purchased it, but it's actually both this building and the Western one were actually five-story buildings that were reduced in size well before Dia uh, purchased the buildings. This gives you a glimpse to the building, to the West Gallery space. And then the West Gallery space, which has painted brick on the uh, east, west, and um, north wall, and then natural brick on the, um, unpainted brick on the uh, south wall. This is a glimpse back. So really creating a small break in your experience between these spaces, again, to reinforce the kind of character of each of these buildings as separate parts of the ensemble. This is a beautiful bowstrings truss building. I can only speculate, this was done in the 1940s, so my thought is maybe steel was scarce at this time and they were, they were using wood to create the structure or maybe just at the time this technology would have been used for a building like this that's one story uh, in this part of the city. And then artists have already, of course, begun to um, uh, in, you know, place their work in the space and, and um, conceive of their work in relation to the space. So the first installation uh, that when the building opened was by Lucy Raven, which included two pieces, this one in the um, center space, and the skylights were, were um, covered for this, as well as a, um, a film that she had uh, made, 
amazing film of a cement plant in Idaho that's just quite phenomenal with an amazing soundtrack. Um, but she conceived of the design of the, of the um, display screen and the bleachers sitting within that space. And then subsequently, Camille Normant uh, did an acoustical installation. This is in the center building again. Uh, really amazing uh, piece. Um, and then the uh, uh, exhibition gallery on the Western with um, this piece, which actually has uh, sounds that vibrate through these beams that you can sit on in the space. So really very um, sensory experience. And then Delcy Morelos exhibition just opened um, in the last couple of weeks. And these are two images from that. Um, this is uh, in the center building. And then uh, this large mud and um, um, stick construction in the um, Western exhibition space. So really amazing. I haven't been to see these yet in person because they were not finished before I left, but I'm really looking forward to um, seeing them. And then the uh, other parts of our project that, that support DIA's mission have to do with um, educational programming. And so the fifth floor uh, board uh, space that we created is both a library, boardroom, and education space. Um, I should say, I meant to mention that um, the American Academy in Rome's offices are in this building as well. <laughs> um, and um, so they're on the third floor, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so Dia is the AAR's uh, landlord. Uh, uh, but um, and these are a, a few photographs of Dia's offices. One of the great things when they moved to the top floor of the building is there was an existing skylight, which brings daylight to the center of the plan. They're unusual as an organization in that there are a lot of private offices for curators and other people on staff. And so getting this kind of flexible center workspace that's daylit is really um, a nice thing. And then basically all the offices have translucent um, uh, glass walls that bring daylight back to the inside of the floor. And then just as an aside, we've been doing other work for Dia. So we just renovated um, Broken Kilometer and Earth Room, uh, both building uh, long-term sites by Walter Di Maria in Dia's spaces in Soho. And uh, the Broken Kilometer space involved replacing the um, uh, existing metal halide lighting with LED lighting, just much more energy efficient and also, but very carefully calibrated for the light temperature and some HVAC work. And then Earth Room was basically up upgrading the um, HVAC and um, other infrastructure in the space and creating a small program room in a space that uh, wasn't previously open to the public there so they can have school groups and seminars and small events there. And then in Beacon, we've done planning work for the building, as well as, this is um, in Beacon, which is about 70 miles north of New York City. It's an old Nabisco factory that, it's like, um, although um, uh, Dia's you know, mothership is in New York, this thing is this 300,000 square foot, enormous, amazing place if you haven't been. Um, but, um, so we've done program planning there, and we're also doing new, um, uh, all gender restrooms that will be replacing the existing restrooms uh, at, in the entry building and are working with them on other, other projects as well there. So I'm gonna wrap up and just say that, um, you know, they're, they're, these projects all share obviously <laughs> quite a lot, but what I think uh, we've learned from them or what I think about in reflecting upon them is that these are really paradigmatic of what you know, we think is important and which we value in our approach to architecture. Um, one is just the long-term relationships that we've had with these places and these clients, which are amazing and, and allow you to really have a, a collaboration and a dialogue, which greatly benefits the outcome, you know, so they're not, regardless of the budget, they're not subjected to a kind of time pressure that, um, that can sometimes diminish the quality of the result. Um, you know, in all of our work, we think architecture is understood, you know, and our ideas should be understood directly through how you use and experience architecture. And certainly these projects show, you know, as the artist's intentions, that um, we value existing building fabric and we 
uh, critically engage it through renovation and ad adaptation and new construction to create really a cohesive relationship between the new and the old. We think that's really important. Um, again, whether a building is entirely new or not, everything in a way is an addition to what is already here. Um, we think it's important to work with humility and empathy um, and as well as a kind of rigorous attention to form and detail and material in, in our work. And then we very much try to balance deference and distinction in terms of the presence of the, our architecture in relation to uh, its purpose or its context. Um, we wanna calibrate the kind of presence and experience of our work in relation to um, uh, the larger goals or experience of a project, which are not always just about the architecture, <laughs> um, or mostly not about the, just the architecture. And then finally, you know, in a way, as these projects do, you know, we strive to create architecture that's in reciprocity to its larger cultural context. And for these clients, it's been really fulfilling and satisfying to be able to, to do that and also to see people experience and use these uh, and to see that happening into the future as well. Thank you. Um, so in all the projects, I, I, you, you mentioned there's a lot of things that are shared, but one is the, the presence of a, an artist at the center of function and, and mission. Yep. And in most cases, the artist is deceased. Right. And you mentioned Dodd and, and his will and kind of taking that as a lead. But could you speak a bit more about how collaboration in the context of artists that are no longer here takes a role in the decision making? Yes, no, I'm glad you asked that question, thank you. So one thing we referred to, and I've written about these projects, I called them posthumous collaborations, <laughs> <laughs> which is only partly true because as you saw from that org chart, you know, there are many living people involved in these projects. Um, but I think what's important is, so the research component of our work in these cases is really dedicated to a deep dive into understanding the intentions of the artist, working with, um, in the case of Rothko Chapel and Judd Foundation, their children who are actually the kind of interlocutors, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, collaborators speaking to their work, some from direct experience, uh, but some from just deep knowledge that they've had over time and being in that role. Um, and so um, the, yeah, we definitely think of the artist as essentially a collaborator. And we, um, in these cases, again, it highlights the sense in which our work is, should be deferential to and in support of what they you know, achieved, which requires, again, a lot of, um, of time in some cases and, and effort and rigor to sort of precisely calibrate in that way. I don't know if I answered your question. Or not, but, um, thank you. Yep, Miranda. Thank you so much. Um, I was curious, before you came to Rome, and now kind of anticipating and after your time here in Rome, what buildings and places do you think the most about? And what are your sources? For, um, wow, that's a yeah. good question. Um, I think the, I mean, you know, it's a kind of truism and in some respect, a cliche, you know, that Rome is this sort of layering of history. So one of the things we value and, and have done in many projects, not just these, is this kind of um, what I sometimes have called a new totality, a kind of integration of new and old that um, draw from, you know, and between each other. So I guess it's a kind of, it's a reciprocity, which is part of the point of this talk. Um, I think one of the, a couple of the buildings, well, one building I hadn't been aware of before is the um, Centrale Montemartini, which is the museum for uh, classical um, statuary that's in a former power station here. If, you, if any of you haven't been there, I highly recommend it. But I think just that kind of juxtaposition, pretty amazing in terms of um, seeing that. Um, it's also very kid friendly if you have little kids because there's something interesting to look at aside from just the, the, uh, the intrinsic interest of this of the statuary. Um, 
And then, I mean, the other building, which, you know, for me has always been this amazing touch point is the Pantheon, which again, I'm not unique in that respect, <laughs> but, but, the, but the, you know, going back again, and I've been to Rome, you know, half a dozen times before over the last 40 years, 40 plus years, to go again and see that and just sort of sense that quality of space is really magical and remarkable. I don't know that we'll go, I'll go back and make another, you know, <laughs> version of that anywhere, but um, I think the other thing that I appreciate and it's present in, I think, the projects like the uh, 101 Spring and Dia and, and, and um, uh, Rothko is the kind of volumes of space that are formed by um, these kind of mass masonry structures, um, which don't always have to be made out of masonry, but it's the kind of um, eliminating certain extraneous things, which unfortunately a lot of times are thrust upon us for code reasons or functional reasons that you can't get around, like um, exit lights and things like that. So finding ways, creative ways to sort of, um, you know, um, I guess calibrate the presence of those elements in the space is something that's, I think, important. And to allow the volume and kind of spatial character of, of a place be um, a kind of expire, inspiring experience is something that kind of I'll, I'll take away from some of the spaces. Like, and actually, even frankly, like the studios that a bunch of the fellows have here, which are these 30 foot square cubes of space. I've made a mental note, you know, that the next time I have an opportunity, I'd like to make a space with a 30 foot high ceiling. That's, <laughs> that's not a kind of ubiquitous, you know, lobby for a building, but is actually maybe for a small group of people to inhabit and, and occupy. So, yeah. Yes. Um, going back to posthumous collaborations, um, you know, you, particularly with Judd and Rothko, you've just spent so much time with these artists that you, know, you could be a Judd or a Rothko scholar if you so chose. Um, what have you learned from them? Well, um, quite a lot. <laughs> I think um, there's a sensitivity to um, space, um, detail, um, I particularly in the in the case of of Rothko, this sort of desire to sort of create an experience that would transcend the kind of two dimensional picture plane that could genuinely engage a kind of deep emotional connection to the viewer, um, and that's why he so treasured this pot, the opportunity to create this place. So um, I uh, yeah I think. Um, and I've written about one of the things that I did during, particularly during the years we were working on the Judd Foundation project, was I wrote quite a bit about our approach to the project. So on our website, there are, is a writing section, and you can see a bunch of the things that I wrote about that project because I thought that was important. One of the things that I valued in learning more about Judd, and I forgot to mention, he wrote an 800 word piece called 101 Spring Street, which is, I think, accessible from the Judd Foundation's website. But he, as, um, you know, as, tough as he was in so many ways, he also really strived to communicate you know, through writing what he did. So maybe to help you find a way to understand the work, which and in, for many people, I think it's hard. It's, um, it's abstract, um, so how to find a way in. So writing about work to me is an important part of what we do, what I personally do to help understand and you know, myself initially and then to communicate that to other people. so well, I think that sometimes one could argue that it looks like nothing was done, right? And I'm wondering how you kind of grapple with that. Uh, and you maybe it speaks to humility, which is yeah. a rare idea in contemporary practice. Yeah, it's interesting because I think it's changing, but there's still a perception in the media, certainly, that, you know, what you do has to be immediately evident <laughs> and uh, as an architect. And I think that one of the things I enjoyed was being able to say, hey, we actually touched every single thing in this building, but we can control what is actually evident of that effort. Um, and so it's, it's gratifying to be able to do that. 
but I am surprised because it's, it's um, you know, people use the word now co-creation. I think that's always been an intrinsic part of our work. You know, we think about whether it's with the artist who may or may not still be here, um, but and others on the project. But I think, um, yeah, we, there's a, there, there's still a lot of, I think, learning to be done in the general public about what it is that architects do and, you know, and there are times and places when I think it's, it's very appropriate that you see and understand this is a thing that is, you know, so these are, again, like I said, a very specific part of our work, but I think there, there are attributes of this work, uh, of these projects that infuse into our other projects. But I think having the capacity to um, control, you know, where you, um, where our presence is understood and felt is an important thing for, I think, an architect to be able to do. And ultimately, to me, it makes it possible to, um, for the life um, that occurs in the building to happen, or the space to happen in a way that can also adapt to change and just be kind of, be something that, that can um, take on qualities that you didn't even anticipate even in the future too. So it gives a kind of openness to um, how a space is used and experienced as well. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you.